Hi, I'm Shane. And I'm Miranda. We're cheeky. Join us as we undertake our biggest road trip to date. Five months around Australia in a four-wheel drive. After a year of closed borders due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we were finally able to travel from New Zealand to our closest neighbour, my home country of Australia. Each episode will take you to a different region in this diverse continent and get up close to its unique wildlife, camping in the outback and Aussie bush. If you ever wanted to explore Australia, this series is for you. In this episode... We head south to the gorges of Kalbarri National Park with its nature's window and skywalk. We stay at a historic campsite filled with abundant wildlife before exploring the rugged coastal cliffs of the National Park. After stopping by the Pink Lake, we head to one of the world's biodiversity hotspots during wildflower season. Hiking through an expansive natural garden at Lazur National Park and get up close to the native fauna that call this region home. We wander through a labyrinth of towering rocks at the Pinnacles Desert before heading back into civilization in the capital city of Western Australia, Perth. Join us on Global Travel Stories. In our previous episode, we explored Ningaloo Reef on the Northwest Cape and the Shark Bay Peninsula. So we're heading to Kalbari National Park right now where we'll do a few lookouts and some nice walks there, including the famous Kalbari Skywalk and Nature's Window. And then in the afternoon we'll head to Blue Holes where we'll take a nice refreshing dip because it's supposed to be really hot today, getting up to 32 degrees. So we had to break out the fly nets. Not only is it really, really hot today, like extremely hot, um, I think 32 is definitely an underestimate, or at least the dryness makes it feel like more, but uh, the flies are probably the worst we've experienced on this whole trip. Um, I feel like this is the purpose we purchased these things in the first place, but hey, at least you don't have to look at my burnt lips all day. Extremely burnt lips. So this one is called Hawk's Head, and we'll look down into the Murchison Gorge over the Murchison River. So here we are at Hawk's Head Lookout. Um, if you look over there, you can see two defined layers. The bottom layer is known as the tidal deposits, which were, are from 400 million years ago. And the top layer is from the ancestral river deposits from 135 million years ago. And 20 million years ago, there was uplift creating this beautiful gorge that you see here. Not too long today. How long is this walk? It is 1.2 kilometers return. And where are we heading? Z Bend Lookout. Or if you're Australian, Z Bend. So these tracks that you can see over here were made by um, some of the earliest land dwellers, the ancestors of scorpions and arthropods. Most likely would have been amphibious, but uh, yeah, the tracks go back 400 million years. Look at that. It's crazy. So we're heading down to Nature's Window right now, which is one of the prominent viewing points of Kalbari National Park. Um, our original plan was to do the loop walk, which is a nine kilometre walk, but um, there are a whole bunch of warnings up there saying that the temperatures can reach uh, up to 10 degrees hotter down in the gorge. In fact, it's over 40 degrees right now down there. People have died down there, so it is something to always consider before you plan these hikes. And if it is a hot day, it's better to miss out than, you know, never return, obviously. The Nature's Window is a must-see in Kalbari National Park. 
Its unique formation features a window framed by a layered sandstone, which forms due to millions of years of erosion by wind, rain, and sea. You can see the ripples here from the ancient sea floor 400 million years ago. Loop tracks down that way, there. And the skywalk, where we're going now, is right up here. Completed in June 2020, the Calvary Skywalk extends an impressive 25 metres out over the Murchison Gorge. The platforms are made out of steel mesh, allowing visitors to see 100 metres directly below as they walk across. of this landscape began about 400 million years ago when land plants had just began evolving. The area would have been a broad, flat, featureless plain, much like the surface of Mars. Over time, sea levels rose and fell, compacting and exposing the sediment to form the rocks known as Tumblagouda sandstone. The gorge itself became eroded approximately 135 million years ago by the ancestral Murchison River, which was later submerged beneath rising sea levels and eventually uplifted due to movements in the Earth's crust. Murchison Gorge section, the interior part of Kalbari National Park. Uh, tomorrow we're going to explore the coastal section, but um, this is pretty spectacular, you know. I, I thought the wildflowers had been over, but uh, apparently some are still around. They were supposed to last until the end of September, and we're almost in mid-October, which is nice. Obviously nothing compared to what we're going to see down south. We're really looking forward to that. Even the way they've done up the National Park is really nice. You know, the style of the designs of the sculptures and the information. Um, it's really, really cool. Didn't quite to do, do as many uh, long walks as we'd planned to do. You know, one day we'll be back, of course, and there are plenty of other things to do and see around here, definitely. So we're at the blue pools, a little bit different from the uh, tranquil photos that we see of the place, but uh, when it's over 30 degrees, you can't really be a, a chooser if you're a bigger. So that was the Blue Pools in Calvary. A little bit uneventful. I sort of went in and Miranda said it was too cold and windy. Did get a little bit rough, but I did see a baby wobby gong in there, which is pretty cool. It's like a little shark, um, sand bottom feeding shark. So yeah, we're gonna head out to the uh, Murchison Station now. Good. Originally settled in 1858, the rich history of Murchison House has been shaped by the hands of pioneering battlers, wealthy wool merchants, and even an Indian prince. It is one of the oldest pastoral leases in Western Australia. The uh, Murchison Station right now. I'm gonna check out some goats. its livestock, some of which are free to roam the property, the Murchison House Station is situated on the Murchison River, making it also home to a huge abundance of native wildlife. <music> At
At sunset, bird life is drawn to the river, including pink galahs, ring-necked parrots, and the rare and endangered Carnaby's black cockatoo. Shane's not talking today. His lips are very sunburnt and out of commission, so <laughs> I will be doing that today. Uh, today we'll be visiting the more coastal side of Kalbarri. We'll, we plan on doing quite a few cool walks, so we'll show you how that goes. And then we're visiting a pink lake along um, the way to our campsite tonight. So that should be fun. Kalbarri National Park covers an area of 1,830 square kilometres from the Murchison River Gorge to the dramatic coastal cliffs near the mouth of the Murchison River. This dramatic variance in scenery and ecosystem makes for two very contrasting areas to explore. The rugged coastal cliffs had a reputation among early European explorers, with many ships battered up and wrecked upon them due to the rough winds and high seas the area experiences. These wrecks can be traced all the way back to the wreckage of a Dutch ship, the Zoutdorp, back in 1712, lending the ship's name to a set of nearby cliffs. Mushroom Rock is named after its protruding, overhanging cliffs due to its erosion to the lower levels. It takes some real imagination to make this association. The round boulders are much younger than the surrounding 420 million year old Tumblagouda sandstone. They were deposited at the base of high sea cliffs during the Cretaceous period as layers of sand about 130 million years ago, representing hundreds of thousands of years of accumulation. Among the stack rock formed by ancient channels can be seen the fossilized burrows of ancient worm-like organisms known as scolithos. Larger flat surface areas were formed during periods of higher sea levels when waves lapped at the surface area of the coastline over tens of thousands of years. This process still happens to this day. So that was uh, Pot Alley, uh, named after a whole bunch of lobster pots that were lost here in this rough seas. Miranda got the name wrong and brought along a little bag of green stuff that she soon put away when she realized she made the mistake. <laughs> Hey 
heading to the Eagle Lookout right now. We were originally going to do a walk called the Bogota Walk, which is actually a 16 kilometer return trip. Um, we don't actually have time for that. That one heads out to the Natural Bridge, which we will get to after we do the... Shell House Grandstand. Let's do it. Our final section of Kalbarri National Park was to be the most spectacular. With a combination of lookouts and high cliff structures, it was a great way to farewell this dynamic and diverse region. That was Island Rock there, and we're about to head, head to the uh, Natural Bridge. Um, this kind of feels like WA's answer to the Great Ocean Road. And um, with the outbreaks in Victoria right now, we may or may not even get there. So I feel like this is a pretty safe compromise if we can't get there this time around. Yeah, I think so too. Gorgeous. But fingers crossed. <laughs> I don't want to see the Great Ocean Road. <laughs> Behind me here we have the Hut Lagoon, also known as the Pink Lake. And it gets its name from the pink hue that we have here in the lake. And that's because of the algae and the bacteria that naturally occur in this lake, giving it that sort of pinkish color. You can see behind me here the uh, BASF plant as well, and they actually extract the uh, minerals from the lake, the beta carotene that occurs in this lake, and they use it for health supplements. And they do this in a sustainable way so that it can replenish itself in the lake. But it's pretty cool that this is a natural phenomenon right here. time on the trip we weren't able to get a spot we tried to get to the uh, Milligan Island uh, eco retreat and uh, instead it was completely full uh, we were quite late and it's not too far from Perth it is a weekend generally speaking these sort of factors alone would inspire someone to get there a little bit earlier than we did but it's okay we were able to find five minutes away just a small caravan park here at Greenhead and uh, it's on this three bays walk which is really beautiful especially at this time of the day uh, the sunset so I'm just gonna have a little walk right now check this out So we are currently doing the Three Bays Walk, which is only a few k's, before we head out of Greenhead to Lazur National Park, where we'll be staying for the night. Hopefully we'll do a few um, walks and hopefully see some wildflowers. It's looking pretty cloudy like it's going to rain, so hopefully that holds off. in the small coastal town of Greenhead, the Three Bays Walkway features a two and a half kilometer paved path showcasing three separate bays by the name of South Bay, Dynamite Bay, and Anchorage Bay. These white limestone shorelines are home to wildlife such as white-bellied sea eagles, osprey, sea lions, and dolphins. So we're here at Lazua National Park, which is considered 
probably the best spot in all of Western Australia for the wildflowers in the springtime. Within a 10 square meter radius here, you can find up to 80 different species of plants, which has the highest concentration in the state. Now, we were originally planning to come here about three weeks ago, but you know, we've had a lot of setbacks on our trip, like going up to Cape York, for example, and it has set us back a little bit, which means that we're just outside of the peak of the wildflower season. There are still some wildflowers around, so we're gonna check that out on some of our walks today, but we'll catch up with the flowers later on in this trip after we go past Perth. So maybe in about a week or so's time, um, we should see a few different places with wildflowers, which will be awesome. Alrighty, so we're about to undertake the Mount Lazua Trail. Looks a little bit more like a hill, just over five kilometer return journey. So not an arduous trip by any means. Probably wondering why we're wearing these head nets right now. And with all these flowers around, you're probably assuming that it's because of the bees, but in fact, it's because of the flies. Um, there are a lot of flies around here and they are actually important for the environment. Not only are they pollinators, but they also become food for a lot of the creatures that live around here. And in fact, we are in the hottest spot of one of the 25 bio hotspots in the world. So there are 25 places on earth that are designated as biodiversity hotspots. Southwest South Australia, uh, Western Australia, I should say, where we are right now is considered one of those places. And this is the hottest spot within that range. So there is biodiversity everywhere around here. And the irony of that is the fact that Australia actually has really, really poor soils. In fact, 140 million years ago, it separated from the rest of the supercontinent called Gondwana land. And in that time, there were no geological pressures from continents colliding, pushing mountain ranges up, or super volcanoes or anything like that. Basically, Australia lied flat in the middle of the Pacific and Indian Ocean during that time and became really dry. And uh, because of that, because of the poor soil, the biodiversity that we have has sort of congregated in these small little pockets of fertile areas and they've created these sort of like islands of biodiversity. And this area here itself over half the species that live here do not live anywhere else on Earth. So you might have seen the foot cleaning station back there, and that's really important to make sure that we're not carrying in any sort of mites or any sort of um, bacteria that can kill off some of the species and plants here. Lazua National Park is one of the most significant reserves for flora conservation in Western Australia. It is home to over 900 plant species, several species of which cannot be found anywhere else in the world and have been included on an endangered list. Its high plant diversity is due to the National Park's unusually large range of geology and topography. Poor soils have also resulted in plants evolving different mechanisms to acquire and use available nutrients. The National Park is also home to more than 100 species of birds that rely on the flora for their survival.
Malazur was first sighted by Europeans as the French ship the Naturalist sailed past Durian Bay on its voyage up the Western Australian coast in 1801. It was named in honour of Charles Alexander Lazur, a naturalist and artist on board the ship. The next recorded sighting was by Captain George Gray, who led a small party through the area in 1839 after they were shipwrecked near Kalbari. And this is why we wear fly head nets. Had uh, two big Western Red kangaroos startled by us walking past, and all of a sudden you hear just these big thumps in the bush. They're just sitting up on the ridge there, watching us chewing their their grass or whatever shrubs they can find up here. This is pretty epic. You know, we've been so focused on the flowers of this trip through this scrubby heathland that we haven't spent much time turning around and looking at how magnificent this view is. It's absolutely spectacular. But uh, we finally reached the top of Mount Lazur. Let's find the actual peak. to the top. How was the hike? You enjoy it? Oh, amazing. <laughs> Didn't even notice the time passing because we were so preoccupied with all the different flowers and we even saw what we thought was a legless lizard. Can't be sure. We'll try and identify it later. I think it was the legless lizard shaped face and ears. Um, yeah, we're just sort of commenting what it would have been like to be like the first botanist to explore this area. Um, and now I truly understand what the obsession is for uh, botanists. Uh, this would have taken years to go through here, all the different types of flowers and things like that. But it's just absolutely amazing. Definitely put it on your list. Um, and we're not even in peak wildflower season. In peak season, probably about two or three weeks ago, this would have been absolutely crazy, but there's still plenty to see around here. In 1849, a party led by A.C. Gregory ascended Mount Lazur. They were followed the next year by botanical collector James Drummond on the first of his many visits to the area. People have lived in the Lazur region for tens of thousands of years and knew the mountain as Kumba Chilla. It was used as a landmark to trade shields, spearheads, stones, shells, and animal skins. Oh. 
on our way out, we stopped at the Ewood Poner Trail, which also looked spectacular if we had more time. We came across the biggest flower we had seen of the day, one that we struggled to identify. So if you know the name, let us know in the comments. Where are we? Carda Campground. Wait. <laughs> Here you fly net there. Have to eat underneath. Cut a campground. In the, are we in Lazio National Park still? I think so. I'm not sure actually. It's a beautiful little campground. Aside from the flies, there are tons of birds around. Chicky here doing the dishes after a delicious dinner prepared by yours truly. Look at our campfire. With this beautiful sunset. And there are birds everywhere. Um, probably can't capture it too well on the GoPro, but we arrived here mid afternoon and uh, already we had a whole bunch of ring neck parrots uh, in our area. And then at sunset, they all came out. We had Corellas, uh, yellow crested cockatoos, we had magpies, all sorts of stuff just flying around here. It's going crazy. And we're still the only people here in this campground. This is absolutely amazing. This is the Carter Campground in Lazua National Park. Rated, the Corella right there. Rated as, um, in my opinion, as one of the top, say top three. Up there with Clem Walton Park and there's a couple of others that were really special as well. This is just beautiful. is the life, camping life. The following morning we were awoken early by the cacophony of bird life in our area. From the noisy ring neck parrots and corellas to a mob of emus grazing nearby. The biodiversity of Lazur had us in awe. Located about two hours north of Perth, the Pinnacles Desert in Nambung National Park is a world away from the bustling metropolis of Western Australia's capital city. So we're in the Pinnacles Desert right now and we're surrounded by these limestone structures known as the Pinnacles. Uh, the limestone itself has been formed uh, under the ocean floor over millions of years. Corals and crustaceans compressed down into limestone. But uh, what scientists aren't certain about is how the structures themselves became shaped like this. And there are two main theories. Uh, one is that the limestone base beneath the soil of an ancient forest um, was eroded away by tree roots. 
allowing certain sections to be sort of left stable while other sections eventually were gradually eroded away. And the other one also involves trees too, that these are essentially fossilized trees, fossilized forests. Um, a little bit hard to discern. One thing they do know though is over time, the sand blows or the uh, sand dunes that we have here have actually covered the pinnacles at certain stages throughout history and most recently they've been uncovered only in the last few hundred years so it's kind of interesting this this sort of disappearing and reappearing forest but it kind of goes on forever it's really really cool So one of the cool things about the Pinnacle Desert as well is that they have a full drive track that goes through here on the sand. So I'm gonna jump in the car and uh, check that one out. The desert contains a four kilometer driving loop that winds its way among the Pinnacle structures, providing a unique way to experience the location. In the 1650s, Dutch explorers thought it to be the remains of an ancient civilization. The Pinnacles were a sacred place to the Nyongar people. According to legend in ancient times, some young men walked along a desert path to this sacred place reserved only for women. The gods to punish them buried them alive. As death approached, the young men asked for forgiveness from the gods. They brandished their weapons through the sand and are now stuck forever in form of limestone spikes. Among the spectacular scenery on our way to Perth, we spotted a lookout over a pristine section of white sand coastline looking out to Wedge Island. Soon enough, we had arrived back into civilization ready to spend the next few days in the city of Perth. So we're here at my Bayon in Perth. Miranda, what have you got there? Pork Thai noodles, vegetarian. Yep, and this is Cambodian style. And I got myself here combination laksa. And we've got some homemade lemon iced tea. There you go, enjoy. Mine is amazing. How was yours, Miranda? Tofu. <laughs> My bail. So we are here in Perth. It was torrentially raining yesterday. We had some really heavy uh, winds. So we didn't end up doing much exploring. So after three days, we are finally looking around Perth, checking out a few things and Tomorrow we're off to Fremantle. So we're in uh, London Court, which is a 
Victorian style London alleyway in the middle of Perth. Pretty cool. Jacob's Ladder. Oh, this is steep. So we're going up to uh, Kings Park right now in Perth. Massive gardens and parkland in the middle of the city. We have to climb up all these stairs to get up. King's Park consists of 400 hectares overlooking the city of Perth, along with the Perth Water, Swan River, and Darling Range. It is home to over 324 native plant varieties, 215 known indigenous fungi species, and 80 bird species. All these kangaroo paws up here at King's Park in Perth. I just wanted to get some perspective on how big these things are. See the size of this one here. Alrighty, I'm gonna climb up the DNA tower with its double helix staircase. It's kind of cool. I get a nice view of the, the park and the city from the top. Kings Park is the most popular visitor destination in Western Australia, being visited by over 5 million people each year. So we're just walking through the Botanic Gardens here at Kings Park and it's really beautiful. They have separate gardens dedicated to different regions down here in the southwest region of Western Australia. Um, all different types of plant species. It's been really beautiful actually. I'm gonna head across the uh, glass arched bridge, then we'll make our way back into town. So, nice place. So apparently the arched walkway closes at 5 p.m. and uh, we're just past 5 p.m. now, so we're gonna have to find another way down, which is a shame because it looks really beautiful, but uh, Oh well, snooze you lose. All right, a giant boab. Haven't seen uh, many of these in a while. I think we saw bigger ones in the Kimberley. Yeah, definitely. But for down here, this is pretty impressive. Oh, look at those mussels. Did you go to fish and chips at the Belgian cafe? Coming up in the next episode... We head south of Perth to the historic city of Fremantle, staying in an old World Heritage listed prison. We learn about its colonial and maritime history before heading to Rottnest Island, the home of the Quokka. Here we get up close to these adorable marsupials and try to land ourselves a Quokka selfie before exploring the pristine island by bike. After we follow the coast down to the Margaret River area, 
exploring hidden underground caves and forests home to some of the biggest trees in the world. We visit the stunning southern coast before heading inland, hiking in some of the world's most biodiverse hotspots at Porongurup National Park. Followed by one of Australia's best day hikes in the Stirling Ranges. Join us on Global Travel Stories. At Global Travel Stories, we want to hear what you'd like to see more of. Please leave a comment below and remember to like and subscribe for our big adventures coming soon.